he, he knew I was going to mention it. Okay. So he graciously left. Okay. Um, this, is, this is something interesting because it's kind of like if the physics we talk about is like a river where things are kind of brought together at the time that they're supposed to happen, that there are resonance connections, um, this is a really eerie one because it turns out, and he had never told me, in the 12 years I've known Ken, we met in 1995, in the 12 years that I've known him, he never once mentioned this until one night at the press club or after the press club event, we were having dinner or something and somebody else said, you know, Ken, you really have to mention to Dick what you told us. And he turned around and he told me the story I'm going to talk to you about in a second. What you need to see is that certain people were very much in favor of him becoming an astronaut, such as this guy, you know, this guy who doesn't do anything for anybody and hides it on a farm there in Ohio and only is wound up and brought out by the White House on these major anniversaries like the 25th anniversary of Apollo. Neil Armstrong basically said that he could be used as a reference for Ken and wrote a very nice little personal good luck because he's acknowledging without Ken Johnson's tutelage he would not have been able to successfully land on and return from the moon. So Ken Johnson, in addition to being one hell of a guy and an amazingly good friend, is a stand-up patriot for what he did, which I'm going to get to in a minute. So let me tell you the weird story. When he applied to be a part of the shuttle program, the way the sequencing went, in other words, you would apply, you'd be accepted, you would then go through a certain training period, you'd be assigned a mission, you'd wind up on a shuttle with a certain manifest, with a certain cargo, with other crewmates and all that. It's more than likely, looking at how the numbers fell and the catalogs and the, and the timelines and all that, that Ken would have been one of the crewmen on the Challenger, which blew up. So if Ken had died as an active astronaut, we would never have met. I would never have known what he had done. We would not have someone of that responsibility able to give us the truth after all these years, to stand up publicly and say, this is what I was instructed to do, this is what I did instead, and here is the evidence to prove it. That is an extraordinary twist of hyperdimensional resonance. It's like Ken was saved by something so he could be with us today and testify to the truth. Which starts in this place. Remember, he was in charge of the data. He was in charge of all of this priceless information. So one morning, um, he is called into the office of the curator of the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, who was obviously the senior guy in charge of all this film. This is canisters of film. You know, we're talking Hasselblad color, we're talking reversal film, we're talking metric film, pan film, tens and tens and tens of thousands of feet, miles of priceless film shot in lunar orbit and on the surface, and five copies were made and kept under Ken's direct personal control in, what was it, room 105? And suddenly he's brought into the head guy's office, Michael Duke, all right, this guy here, and instructed to destroy all but one copy of all that film from each mission going back to Apollo 8. We've calculated now that that's something like 36 separate sets of film covering an enormous amount of footage, miles of film, to destroy it. Not to give it to a university, not to give it to a high school, not to you know, take it over to CBS and say, hey guys, you want some film? But to literally throw it away, burn it, put it in a dumpster and all that. And he was so upset that what he did was he destroyed three sets and he put one set of one complete set of the missions from nine, from eight through, at that time, 16, in a duffel bag and took it home. And it stayed with him as he moved a couple of times because, you know, military guys, and NASA guys, you know, you move from contract to contract and he wound up at Boeing as a flight instructor for the 737. Every time you remember, you know, um, our friend Mike here, he designed them. Mike taught the guys how to fly them. So that's kind of a counterweighting, you know, I'm thinking, you know, okay, 
up front the guys were taught by Ken and it was designed by Mike and I hang on. Okay. So ultimately he decided that he would unload most of this film which he was uncomfortable with having salvaged not actually knowing what the legal liability, I mean no one ever told him this was classified. All they said was get rid of it. And in recollection now he, he remembers that Michael Duke had been away a lot in the weeks leading up to that, and this was around Apollo 14, and that's when we kind of suspect and have put the pieces together that that's when they figured out they really had a problem. That there were things the crews were photographing that were so astonishing that they could not be covered up. And Ken had a very interesting story, which I won't bore you with tonight because someday you'll get a chance to hear it from him directly. We shot a lot of film of him in Washington and it will be, you know, on the on the print, on the on the film that we're making that'll be released in the theaters next year. So you'll hear Ken, you know, a personal story on this. But as part of the Apollo fourteen sequence, he was ordered to take film out of the vault, show it to a group of scientists and put it back in the vault. And as he was taking it back to put it in his archive under lock and key, this is a motion picture film that was taken looking out the window of the limb, he went through an area that he had never been in before. He's kind of taking a shortcut from, I guess, the auditorium to his office or, or, or the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, which, as you can see, was way back on the back side of the campus. So it was, it's a long walk. I've been there. I've done the walk. It's a long walk. And yes, you would probably want to take a shortcut. So he went through this building he'd never been in before. And he sees these people in there, and they're bending over light tables, and they've got paint and brushes, and they're painting out the sky on these negatives from the Apollo missions. And he says, what are you guys doing? And one guy, you know, Wiseacre, says, oh, we're strippers. <laughs> yeah, really. That's a technical term from Hollywood where you basically strip out all of the, you know, little dust and lint and all that that accumulates when you make multiple generational copies of film. Except in this case, the gal said, well, what we're doing is we're painting out the stars that would be distracting. Now, this is absolutely crucial because for all the people that think that NASA faked going to the moon, shot it on a soundstage somewhere, and we'll talk about that during the Q&A, if they had done all that, don't you think they would have carefully arranged that there would be no stars in the sky that you'd have to paint out? That obviously is a testimony to the fact that this was real data and they were painting out offending things. Now, when you do the calculation, it turns out that the stars are much too dim. What they were painting out, and here's where it gets really interesting, they were obviously painting out the bits and pieces of glass that are stuck in these domes, these grids that I'm going to show you, that are bright enough to sparkle and reflect sunlight directly into the camera and be recorded and be visible and be distracting. And they did not know what they were painting out because this woman said they were painting out the stars as a distraction. She didn't know she was looking at bits and pieces of a lunar dome. Remember, the lie is different at every level. So when I say that most of the NASA system is honest, I have proof. The very people who were doing part of the cover-up did not know what they were covering up. They were told they were painting out distracting stars. They weren't told they were painting out distracting alien ruins on the moon. And so ultimately what Ken did is we gave part of his stash to this guy. This is um, Adolphus Witten, who was the president of Oklahoma City University, which was Ken's alma mater. And you can see from this letter there was a long, very warm personal relationship. And so in 1978, I mean, he was told to destroy this film in 72, you know, as we can reconstruct, 